Yeah, okay, we're on page Samaches, otherwise known as page 68. Let's begin. Uh, if you have cooking being done by a, let's see, for example, you have a 68, Samaches. Let's say, for example, someone has a helper in the house. The shifcha. Today's cleaning help is not considered a real shifcha according to halacha. So the real shifcha is someone who's working because they have to work. They're forced to work, right? Remember I spoke about this last time, I think? Yeah. But if today, if they don't like it, they'll leave. Then you're stuck. Then, you, then we, we cry for a month and we find someone new, right? Then we have to train them for three months. We have to dive and it works out. It's, it's a big deal. But uh, in the olden days, they were they were slave. Whatever we told them they had to do, it's different. So this also has an this has an implication with regards to halacha because since they're not slaves, and if they're going to cook, they're not doing it out of servitude. So then there's more of a concern of kirva, more of a concern of closeness and and being done as a, as an act of trying to develop a relationship, which is a problem in halacha. So you throw. That an Evah Kenani is a non-Jewish servant, and Shifcha Kenan is a non-Jewish servant, a female. There's an opinion that says there's no Bishalakum in that case. Because an Evah of a Yid is not part, is not in the, in the same category as a Goy. Because the chashash of his chatness, the concern of intermarriage is only what the non Jew does out of their own volition, out of whatever they do out of their own will. Whatever the non Jewish servant is doing against their will, that doesn't bring about a sense of closeness. They're doing it because they're forced to. As far as the Lashayah has all about the Shwakas and Shwadman, this Vara that they're doing it out of servitude and therefore it's not going to bring about to a certain closeness is only applicable to a shivcha, to a servant that's mushubadis loyalness, that we buy them for life, which doesn't happen today. But today's household domestic help is just someone you hire for a certain amount of time. And they have the din of a regular nachri, like a regular nachri. If a non-Jewish housekeeper cooked in your home, we have two different factors that come into play. According to one opinion, the Chacham did not prohibit what was cooked in a Jewish home. <laughs> They don't accept this opinion, by the way, but there's such, I'm just explaining this, the, the logic behind the opinion, saying that the whole reason why the Chacham, remember, we're dealing with the rabbinic prohibition here, right? The whole reason the rabbis establish this prohibition is in order to prevent intermarriage. So in a Jewish home, a Jewish environment, I don't have to be worried about intermarriage because it's a Jewish environment, right? The concern of intermarriage is when there is a, a strong engagement in a, in a non-Jewish environment, etc. And the second reason is because the Shifcha is not part of the Gzeira. So in the olden days, when you had, for example, let's say a bonfire, if you're cooking with live fire, you go to camp, you see a bonfire, we know that the only way for a bonfire to continue to work and continue to, to burn is you have to tend to it. You have to fan the flames, you have to put in some more logs, you have to sometimes stir it a little, you know, to, to, to get the, to fan it and all that. So you have to do something to it. So all those acts of doing something to it are an act of contribution to the cooking process. So we're going to say by a live fire, even if a non-Jew was involved, in some way or shape or form, a Jew is also going to be involved by fanning the flames, bringing the logs. There's involvement there. Today's ovens don't work that way. You turn on the button. So if a non-Jew turned on the button and opened the oven, you got a problem because there's nothing else for us to do. So in the old days, like I said, a live fire. So sure, one of the Jews stirred the coals and it's called the Shiesol. The Paskim say that in the case of strong need, so in the case of strong need, if it was in a Jewish home and it was done 
you know, if, if it's a live fire, it's easier. So then maybe we could find a heter. But this is not something we should do in a regular case, unless it's a very strong case of need. She asked a shayla. Because of shkachu a minute. Kol nisbor never be a meyem shayadech minyam bayis machtes zeish shavetanur neishach heter delel. That was all talking about in those days when people would actually stir the fire and, and they had to reply. Today's oven, we don't actually stir the, the fire in Hokel. We're not we're not lean to Shifcha Goya we see still Khatkhila. We're not leaning to allow a Shifcha Goya in a Jewish home Khatkhila. Shabbat Yev and Mutter Kush is bar. Rather come sick at base and autonom should be menu. Even according to those that are lenient, a Jew obviously has to be going in and out. Nor that the non-Jewish house help, the domestic house help should not put in a davar asr into the food, a non-kosher ingredient, let's say, or, or mixing milk and meat, for example. We have to be careful about that. How do we verify that doesn't happen? We go and spot check on them. By the way, I'll tell you, I'll answer your question in a moment. But I, I said a word last week, right? About Yitzhak Vinichas. Did I say it to you? Yeah. Share with you? Right. So it has to be Yitzhak Vinichas, the way to feel it will come back in. Yes. Um, in a Chabad house, do they do the same thing with like when they don't do Shabbos? That's a very, it's an excellent question. Let me address that. So there's there are two opinions as to whether or not the question is okay, so a Jew has to be the one lighting the fire. That everyone agrees. But the question now becomes, does it have to be a religious Jew? So there are two opinions about that. One opinion says it has to be a religious Jew. One opinion says it does not have to be a religious Jew. It just has to be a Jew. And the, the logic behind these two opinions are as follows. According to the opinion that says it just has to be a Jew, the main reason why the rabbis established the laws of Bishalakum are to prevent intermarriage. A, a religious Jew is a lot of marry a non-religious Jew. It's a kosher marriage. Maybe they have to work on their level of observance, whatever. But it's a kosher marriage. It's a kosher union. So according to that reason, it's fine. According to the reason, maybe they're going to put in some non-kosher ingredients into the mix. Well, then that applies if they're not religious because we can't really trust them. We cannot entrust them. So that's why that's the reason to be stringent and to require the person to be religious. In practice, it's obviously better to be stringent, to insist that the person lighting the fire is Jewish and also religious. But in a Chabad house environment, where the entire existence of the Chabad house is to be makarev, all the yidin to, to Yiddish guy, that's really like their own home. So in a case like that, you have to tread carefully. If it's going to distance somebody or make them uncomfortable, I wouldn't tell them not to turn on the fire. I'll tell you a story. And I know I'm being recorded on Zoom, and I'm going to say it publicly. My brother has a Chabad house in California. Chabad of Pasadena. For those of you who met my brother, anyone meet, anyone meet him here before? Rabbi Chaim Anyway, so he asked me a question about 10 years ago. He had someone in the Chabad house who was not yet religious at the time. The person's not religious, but Hashem. But they used to cook in the morning for breakfast. And he wanted to know, if is it a problem? I mean, you know, they're yid, they're yid, but they're not from. I said, let it continue. Because the person would come early in the morning, they'd come to shul, come fill in, and cook a kosher breakfast for the, everyone to come, the minyanir, they called me, you know. So it was part of his Yiddish guy. I said, if you're in the, in the Chabad house and you can also turn on the fire, raise the flame a little bit, so it's better. But don't make him feel bad about it. Don't, don't, it's not worth it. The same thing is in your own home. Uh, you know, you're religious and you're, let's say your mom wants to cook for you, she's Jewish, but she's not religious. Don't make a fuss about it. When she's not in the room, you can raise the flame, it's better. But not in a way that's going to make her, don't say, oh, mom, I got to turn on the fire. Don't say that to her because logically, you have what to be to rely upon, and you don't want to make her feel good. And, and it's also the Jewish home. The mother Jewish, it's, it's her home. But try and if it, if she's upstairs going to the laundry, you just you know you stir the food away and all that. Okay. And I have the same question. So like if someone's a bar shula, but they um let's say they came from like a non kosher environment and they went to like a high school level and like um and started keeping Shabbos like fully um and they're living with like roommates like. The roommates are not religious? No, like in let's say you move from like your parents' house into Carter Heights with religious roommates. Right. And you weren't keeping Chavez like hundred percent back home, but now you are. Okay. So can you um turn on the fire? Of course, yeah. Shama Shabbos, yeah. For sure. Um now the next question, okay, gets into what about if a household help 
they want to cook for themselves. And it's even worse because if the, the housekeeper is the cooking for someone else, so that's more derech avdos. It's being done out of servitude. They have to do it. If she cooks for herself, it's worse. Then even with the Ebed, there's no breathing room, so to speak. There's no, it's not Avdos. And you also can't say that the Jew is going to stoke the fly, fire because it's not Jewish, you know, it's not being cooked for the Jews. Therefore, you have to be very careful if you have domestic help at home, not to allow them to cook at all, period. If they're going to cook, then Yasser, because then the kalim become also because of bishalakum, and you have a problem with the kalim if they do cook to themselves. So therefore, in practice, you have to make a policy that they don't cook anything in your home. I'll just tell you what I do in my house. Even things that are edible raw, I don't allow the non-Jew to cook because I don't want them getting used to cooking at home. If they're going to start cooking, let's say they're going to cook applesauce. They're going to eat the apples raw. Or they're going to let's say, cook timis. You can eat the carrots raw. Then they're going to say, oh, I made myself applesauce, I made simis, I can also make myself an egg, which is not edible raw, which is a problem. So we have to set the boundary, right? We're not teaching them Torah, like get to know all the ins and outs. So the boundary is, it's a broad boundary. We don't, we don't no cooking. So, if, so I have Shabbos in my house, and the, the helper, she, she sets up the chinik, she fills it up with water, and again, water doesn't have to be bishri as well, because you can drink the water raw the way it is. We do it all the time from the tap. But I don't let her plug it in either. She she just sets it up unplugged, and I have to plug it in, and you know they're not that's and there was a few times where we unfortunately didn't have hot water that Shabbos because we forgot to plug it in. But the pile, that's we have a system, there's, there's a boundary, right? So that's an example of using the fifth of Shulchan Aruch. You have to use common sense when we set up a system, it should be something that's really well protected. That's also another thing I wanted to point out. You know, Allah, it's very fascinating. You know, you have what's what's permitted according to the strict letter of the law, but not advisable. So it's permitted for the non-Jew to go in my house and cook applesauce. She's allowed to make zimis, but it's not advisable, right? Therefore, I don't let her do it. Yes. So there are two opinions about that also. With regards to Bishal Akum, one opinion says that the absorption also become the foods are sir. Chachamim made that prohibition. And there's an opinion that says that the, that the prohibition also extends to the absorption. What's the taste of the food? There's an opinion that differs that doesn't agree with that, but we follow the opinion under ordinary circumstances that says that the vessel does become asr by Bishalakum. By Pasakum, the vessel does not become asr, by the way. So I, I spoke about this. So, for example, if you go to, let's say, a pretzel factory, it's kosher parv, it's not pas yisrael. If I want to make Libra's pretzels or I want to make Pashka's pretzels, I just have to go in there and turn down the fire. It's a power of plant and boom, everything is going to be passy straw with that fire that I just turned on, you know. So it's very different when it comes to pass. When it comes to bishel, it has to be turned on by a yid because otherwise you have a problem of the kalim as well, besides having a problem with the food. Now, how do we determine, how do we actually scale up Jewish involvement? What does that look like? Does the Jew actually have to cook everything? Do they have to buy all the ingredients? They have to go shopping? And we're going to see in a moment that you have to just turn on the fire. You have to do something what's called like a significant contribution. Not very long, just take 10 seconds turning on the fire. But it has to be a significant contribution. Buying the food is not considered a significant contribution because that's, that's more of an act of prep. But an act of cooking significantly would be turning on the fire. Interestingly enough, by the way, the Sfardim, Mechaber, as we're going to learn, is more stringent, more strict. He holds that simas kedeir al ha'ish is what makes it bishul yisro. Not just turning on the fire is not enough. You actually have to put the pot down on the fire. So according to the Mechaber, the Jew has to actually put the pot on the fire. So that's called bishul beis which is harder to do and more usually more expensive because you need to have more hashkafa. I'll give an example. You go to a Sephardi event and they're serving steaks. So if the chef is a Sephardi religious Jew, so then everything's going to be Bishop Beis Yosef. If he's not, let's say the chef is not Jewish, then every steak being put down on the grill has to be put down by the Sephardi, by the Mashkiach. And you know, you're in the kitchen there and it's a high pressure environment and the chef is there screaming and they have knives also. 
You don't want to start up with them. I'm just kidding about that. But no, but seriously, it's a pressure environment. The mashkiach's got to put down every stake. So such mashkiach get paid more. They get, a, they get paid a premium because it's a lot harder. No more work to do. Any place you go? Yeah, you always ask good questions. It's a good question. I, do you, I don't trust no one. I, okay, so I, I think you have a very good sense inside yourself, a good sense of, you know, hey, I, don't, you? I don't, what? It bothers you. what? I will tell you this trust but verify. Meaning to say, you have to verify, you have to be mevadir what's happening. There's many different standards out there. Um, most certifications have some value to them. The question is, to what extent are they going? What are the policies? What are the requirements, right? So look into it. So you're trusting, but you're still verifying to make sure it's, it meets your standard, meets what you're looking for. That's what I would say to you. <laughs> A heksha that has a lower standard, meaning that they, they have more kulot, they allow certain things. They're not being dishonest. They just have a lower quality product that they're selling. It's like a store. They sell low quality shoes. Are they dishonest? No. They're not claiming to be the highest quality. They're selling this. this is what, and there's a market for that. So the same thing, the heksha that, that has a lot of leniencies, but the leniencies are found in Torah. And they're marketing themselves, as long as they're being honest about who they are, that's not being dishonest. That's okay. Doesn't mean it's for us. Doesn't mean I like it. But doesn't mean they can't do it either. Okay? By the way, I want to share a story with you, and I'll take your questions. One of my, I, I like stories, as you know, but this one is a, is a real, it's a zinger. You know what a zinger means? It's a, it's a, a lot of chokhmah in this story. Anyway, like about, about 50 years ago, 50 years ago, probably, maybe even 60 years ago, I don't know. It was, uh, if I was alive at the time, I was, I was a young boy. Anyway, um, someone came over to Harav Zaman Shimon Devarkin, the Rav Lubavitch. They asked him, how can we giving a hechsher on the Zionist bread? Uh, the Rebbe says that Baal uh, Nefesh should be machmer, someone who is careful with their neshoma, should be machmer and stringent and not, not consume such products. So he answered the person by saying, you're right. Alf Rebbe says about nefesh should be machmer, should be stringent about not consuming such products. But we're giving a hechsher for bali haguf. We're giving a hechsher for those bali haguf, meaning human beings, flesh and blood. <laughs> In other words, there are some things that a person on their own is going to come to, maybe through the coaching of their mashki, uh, mashbiya, through the guys, say, okay, zelo I have a higher standard. But it doesn't mean it can't be certified in the market. So there's different levels. So Chabad is your highest level? The avoid of Chabad. When it comes to the Hachshu, you have to find a good Hachshu. Right? Chassidim Bechlau are usually more machmer than regular Yidin. We try, because we try to take the high road. We try to take, do things in the best way possible. Chachamim only prohibited Bishal Akum if the entire cooking was done through the Nachis of the Nanjuah. The Jew was not involved at all. If the Jew was involved a little bit in the cooking, like for example, they took the pot off the fire before it was fully cooked. And afterwards, the Jew puts the food back on the fire. Now we're on page I. One of the beginning of the cooking process, the Jew stirred the pot. They stirred the food. It's again an act of cooking. That's enough to actually save it from Bishalakim because the Jew was involved in the cooking process. Because now it's going to cook quickly. Even if the, the Jew throws in, let's say, one one log of wood into the oven. Or even, this is very interesting, even if, even if a non-Jew lights a fire from a fire that a Jew lit. So let's say a Jew lights a candle, 
burning. And Nadja comes with a candle and, and takes and lights a fire from the candle that do lit, and then takes that burning candle and lights their, 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 their stove. That's called, it's, it's one step removed because the Juden actually light the stove itself. They lit a flame that lit a flame that lit the stove. That's called Eish me Eish Yisrael. It's Mutter B'Diev. It's permissible after the fact, meaning in the case of duress, if you have no other choice. So I'll give you an example. It's very interesting because I'm going to show you how this is applied in the, in the modern day world. So for example, if, you have, if we can draw this, I'm going to try and draw this. I mean, for those of you that know my wife and daughters, they're the artists in the family. Thank God, God blessed me with certain things, but artwork is not one of them. And I married an artist. Anyway, so we'll try my best here. We have, this is gonna be our Maple Leaf Viking stove. Okay, so it's gonna be five burners, three, five over here. We got a little fire. Now each one of them have a little thing in the middle, a little circle. This circle is a, is a burning pilot. The, the pilot here all the time, a little fire coming out, okay? So this burning pilot, if a Jew lights the fire, now this pilot's on all the time, and then if a non Jew comes and just raises the flame, and now suddenly this flame shooting out of this burner, the Jewish fire is right there. That's called Eishmei, it's, it's, it's actual Jewish fire. It's not Eishmei Yisrael Yisrael, because the Jewish fire is right under the pot. On the other hand, if you don't have like a commercial stove top, let's say you have a regular stove top, they don't make these today anymore, by the way, because they, they use electronic ignition in order to save on conserve on, on energy, which is a which creates more of a problem for us, by the way, from a lot of perspective. I wrote an article about that called technological tension, if you're interested in, in researching it. But it's not how about that work. Anyway, so here we have a regular stove top, it's only four burners. There's no fire over here. There's only a, the old ones used to have a little fire in the middle. Like a fire here coming out. Let's see the Jew lit that flame. When you turn on the gas over here, it, 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 it draws a fire from here unto here. So what this is doing, this is Eish me Eish la Yisrael, a fire from a Jewish fire creating a new fire. That's only permissible by the Abbot. It helps, you know, if, if you're really stuck, but in, in a commercial setting, it's more, it's more the hot hill that gets better. Okay. I passed the, I hope I passed, whatever I survived. <laughs> By the way, I'll tell you what, it, it, it reminds me, when my wife gave birth to my second child, my daughter, she's already a girl already, she's, she's, a, she's a, already graduated seminary. Anyway, so, so I had to take her to school. No, 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 but she gave birth to my, my third kid, my, my, my second daughter. My, my, my older daughter was like four years old, I don't know, three and a half years old, and I had to take her to school. I bring her to her mora, and I don't know how to make hair, I'm gonna make her hair, so I, she's, she's like a four year old, three and a half year old kid, and her hair is good. So I took a, took a pony, I ripped it together, you know, I made it together, that's it, send her off. So my wife had given birth, like just, I think a few hours before, I came home just to take care of the kids, bring them to school. Um, and, and nobody knew, it was, it was like fresh news. The Mora looked at my daughter and looked at her and her hair and said, Mazel tov, your mother had a baby. Yo. <laughs> she saw it right away. <laughs> my wife is very artistic, you know, she does not, anyway. Anyway, okay. Um, anyway, okay, so that's the story with the, um, where am I going to here? This is about Eish Meishel Yisrael. So now, um, after Meishel Yisrael gives it, it's called the Tehatan, or if a Jew throws in, let's say, a twig, or, or a, a non-Jew lights from a fire, from a fire, to a fire, it's Motul Chat Bachila. Some say, Yesh HaKos, Roshayin Kedai, this man chazer elem, Nasa Bishel Beis Yisrael. Some say we should only rely upon this opinion in a Jewish home. Okay, to rely a little bit about the sheet of Rabbi Ram and David said there, and Rak only in the case of the rest. We have no other choice. That's what the Rosh Hashanah writes. The Kivish Nechal of Shittim says since there are different opinions about this, Yishli Siyat to Meirah Yishli Ask Hashayla and better not to, to rely on Eishma Yishli Yisrael. So example I gave you, it's only it's only something we should, we should rely upon with the Avid. If I see him on Nachri as Abishul, if the Nachri already finished the cooking. Even though the 
the Jew is going to cook it some more. It's not going to help the food. Because the food's already cooked when, the, when it's fully cooked. So when, once the food's fully cooked, the Jew can no longer save it from Bishalachum. These are only for the Ashkenazic community. But, however, the Sfardim even if the Jew, the Jew actually turned on the fire, however, the non-Jew put down the, the kadeda, the pot on the fire, nikr bishalakim, it's still called bishalakim. Because according to the mechaber, simas kadeda ala eish, putting the actual pot on the fire itself is the act of cooking. It's not enough to turn on the flame. Any questions on what we said so far? Go to them, you have a question? No? Good. Why? No, I just want to know. Okay, good. Anyone here a Sfardia? No? Okay. So the Sfardim, by the way, in America have a problem because it's very hard for them to have, to keep Bishop Beis Yosef. They go to any function, let's say you go to a wedding, almost all of them, unless it's in a Sfardish community, are going to be Bishop Beis Bishal according to the Mechaber, not, not according to the Mechaber, not Bishal Beis Yosef. It's going to be Bishal according to the Ramah, which according to their tradition is not good enough. Okay, next thing I want to talk about is, is ovens. What? Ovens. Hello. So an oven that we have at home, Again, today, it's electronic ignition. I don't think there's a burning pilot in, in most residential ovens that we have in our homes, in our kitchens. But commercial ovens, it's probably more common. You'll find they have a burning pilot. Sometimes you'll have, let's say, a double oven. Up and bottom will be a burning pilot in the center chamber. And that pilot will then feed the various fires in either one of the either cavities of the oven, top and bottom, respectively. So if you have a burning pilot in an oven, like I said, just, you know, without me going through the whole artwork, the litany, but it, just imagine that you have the oven and then I've got a burning pilot in the center. So if I turn on the oven on top, it's going to pull that fire into the chamber. It's going to be Yisrael, the fire of a Jewish fire. And the same would be on the bottom. So again, it's most of the oven, only permissible if I have no other choice or after the fact. It's not an ideal setup. But in most ovens that we have in our kitchens, I don't think this actually has that. So it's even worse, meaning to say that I don't even have a burning pile that was lit by a Jew. So if a non-Jew lights the oven in my, my, in my oven, I got a the fire in my oven, I got a problem. We should not allow a shifcha goya to cook in our, in our those ovens that have a little bit of a burning pilot, but if you have a burning pilot and you turn on the gas, it's going to make the flame go bigger. Then, if the Jew lights a small fire, then it's permissible for the non Jew to cook in this oven. Again, you have that leniency. If there's a burning pilot, the same leniency I said before about the stovetop. But again, most ovens don't have the burning pilot today. If they do, then you have a little bit of a backup. It's called like a backup plan if something goes awry, something goes wrong, so to speak. We should only rely upon this if it's in a Jewish environment, a Jewish home. By the way, this is very relevant when it comes to restaurants. If the restaurant is Jewish owned, so it's a Jewish home. Then you have that extra opinion that you rely on as a, as a joint. So it's been a joint effort. We don't rely on that opinion by itself, but as a joint effort, it makes the whole thing better. But if the restaurant's owned by a non-Jew, you don't have that opinion. It's a problem. Um, even if the bishop, the cooking was in a Jewish home, there's a cool good day It's a big cool we shouldn't rely on it. In general, whenever you have something that's permissible, according to the bare bones letter of the law, it means that if we have no other choice, we can do it. It's not, we're not well protected. It's just the bare bones. I'll give you an example. I'm going to give you a muscle. A muscle from the auto industry. 
you'll excuse me, but I, I had, when I was a kid, I had a fascination with cars. I still love cars, but, but I lived in Boston. We used to drive from Boston to New York, like once a month. When I was about seven or eight years old, no, probably even more like nine, I think maybe nine or 10. And I could name every car on the road. I, I knew every model, every car. I, just, I looked at the car, I knew exactly what my car was. And I loved, I just loved cars. Anyway, so you can go, you can take a road trip. You could drive from here to California with a, there was a car called the Yugo. It was made in Yugoslavia. It was a bare bones car, four wheels, no radio. You know, the joke on that car, on that, on that, uh, about that car was you slam on the brakes, the engine ends up on your lap. You know what I'm saying? It was just bare bones. It was like $3,900 they were selling it for back in the day. But I mean, it was a piece of junk. I mean, but it wouldn't be advisable to travel across country in a car. There's no safety features. You know what I mean? It's noisy. It's, it's an econo box. So can you go? Yes. But is it advisable? No. It's the same thing over here. Like, you know, love, don't think when it comes to Allah. Can you really, can you, if you age may age, you stroll in a, a non Jewish environment? Uh, it's very sketchy. If you have no choice, you can get away with it, but it's not advisable. Don't do it. All my tonoma chadash in them is to me, but today's love that don't have a complete constant fire. Pazula shaykh by him, Tanaka Kalaha does that. They don't have this hetter at all because the newer ovens, the technology that Chachamim, they figured out, oh, let's make things more efficient, more, more uh, conserved on energy. We're not going to have a burning pilot. And they made the Jewish people crazy <coughs> because now we don't have a burning pilot to protect us, all in the name of conserving energy. Okay. Now, what happens if I have food that's already been cooked by the Jew? Can a non-Jew warm up such foods? So again, according to the strict letter of the law, she's allowed to, because the food is already cooked by the Jew. But is it advisable to allow her to warm things up in your house? No, it's not advisable. So I'll, I'll tell you a story about that. So when, years ago, I was a mashkiach in a catering environment. Of course, all the, all the fires were turned on by the Yid, and all the food was Bishul Yisrael, etc. But then they have these shaving dishes where they're just warming up foods. So <laughs> under the shaving dish, you have to light the, the, the lighting gel, which is a, the blue gel. You have to light it, right? So technically speaking, a non-Jew is allowed to light it because the food being there has already been cooked by a Jew. But still, I didn't let them do it anyways, because I don't want them to get used to lighting fires. Jews just light all the fires. So they'd go around with the, the lighter, and just light all the shaving dishes, etc. Yeah, that's our policy. If, if you're going to have a shifcha, a maid servant cook for you, a lot of different <coughs> Problems can arise. I feel there's a spice, a love, is a misody, even someone who knows not to mix up milk and meat. You can't really trust them regarding kashras. This is even for a Jewish uh, helper at home if she's not a Shemir Shabbos, if she doesn't keep Shabbos. If someone needs help, in the kitchen, but someone's going to cook with them, but they're not Jewish. They have to get some guidance, rabbinic guidance, to make sure it's done in a proper way. So what, what the proper way is, in, in a nutshell, is you allow the non-Jewish person to do all the prep work. They can cut the vegetables, they can core the apples, they can peel the potatoes, all the prep work can be done by them, but the actual cooking, turning on the fire, should be done by the yid. It's basically a, a way it's done. And if it's not, if I did not think that uh, I'm going to stir the fire. So then did you stir the fire? You stirred the food? No, if I didn't know, then I ate not the food. Then it's, it's Bishal Akko. Now, it depends. It's, it's non kosher rabbinically. It's not like eating pork, which is in a manatora. It's rabbinically not kosher. Um, but if it was in a Jewish home, and so we have a little bit, you know. It's okay, we're all, we're all learning, but I'm just, I have to teach the halachot. This is the halacha. Um, and if there's a fire, and then I'm going to do this, and they're going to say, so like, that's permissible. The, the, the mutar b'diyevet, if you have no choice, if there's no other, 
you know. Like you said, it's the stove top. It's the stove top, yeah. Unless it's a commercial stove top. Commercial stove top, you have the fire right under the, blur the burner. That's good. That's a hot chilim out there. It's not a problem. <laughs> And now we're going to talk about other forms of cooking. The Chachamim, when they made the prohibition of Bishalach, we're talking about a regular way of cooking. But there are other ways to prep food. I remember, okay, another piece of, another story. What should I do? This is the way my mind works. I can't help it. I, I, about 20 years ago, my wife and I were in Florida. We went, I think it was a vacation. Uh, when you're raising young children to go on vacation, it's like it happens like every four years. It really should happen every month. But anyway, uh, husband and wife have to go out there. No, I, I think Reb Zaman Shimon told told somebody uh, I worked in our office, uh, an older woman, she told me, she says she was told by the Rob that she and her husband have to go out at least once a month. Really, they should go out once a week. But anyway, I, I, we went on vacation to Florida for a few days, I still remember it. So we went to this restaurant, an okay certified restaurant. And my wife, by the way, just to give a little background to the story. And as a bacher, I thought that pineapple grows in the can. Uh, fresh pineapple, you, have, you think pineapple, open up a can and you have pineapple. She told me that pineapple actually grows in the field and you cut the, the shell and outside and you fresh pineapple. So I was having pineapple every morning. She, she, once we got married, she said, no, no, you have to take fresh pineapple. Uh, Bachem don't do these things. They take from the can. Anyway, but the can, the top of sauce. Anyway, so, but when she told me a lot of foods I never touched before I got married. So I, think, I think of this. Anyway, so we're in this restaurant and she's encouraging me to try some new foods and I was a very picky eater. I think I ate. She's saying, try this fish. Okay, I fish I eat, but this was not even cooked fish. It was marinated. Raw fish. I said, so you need I mean, raw fish? I said, can't be. How can I do this? It's crazy. No, no, it's marinated. It's marinated for 24 hours. It's flavorful. My mice is shifting. I was convinced. I ate it. It was delicious. But I, and, I, and, I, and this is exactly what we're discussing now. You can prepare food and make it ready to eat with ways other than fire. You can salt it, you can pickle it, you can marinate it without, right. cooking. without cooking. So when the Chachamim made the laws of Bishalakum, the laws were specifically about regular ways of cooking, fire. But if I cook, if I prepare foods in a funny way or an unusual way, not a common way, the Chachamim didn't prohibit that. So if a non -Jew, let's say, takes fish and they, and they salt it, and now it's ready to eat, it's not Bishalakum because the Chachamim did not prohibit that method. Or if they smoke the fish with live wood, with wood chips and, and then the smoke embers create and actually make it ready to eat. It's not a problem with Bishalakum if it didn't go into an oven. Um, if it's marinated, it's also not a problem with Bishalakum. So I'm just bringing out the point and only traditional regular forms of cooking are a problem with Bishalakum. Non-traditional ones are, are not a problem. Okay, we're gonna have to stop here with your gimbal. Any questions on what I said? No? Okay, well, I'll do a quick, uh, one more quick story. I have to run exactly at 10 o'clock today. Sorry, um, let me just mark down where I'm also you give them. Okay, so Mr. Shama, I'll be here tomorrow. I'm gonna to continue from that. And um, we have another two minutes. I'm covering for Ravazdabah. And then Ravazdabah is gonna do it next week for me. Um,